Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Biological Industries USA and presented by Leah Thornberry Kent, Technical and Scientific Support Trainer here at BIUSA. My name is Lori Oakes and serve as the General Manager. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone in the audience that we will hold a Q&A session following the presentation. We encourage you to submit text questions at any time during the presentation by typing your questions into the question pane of the control panel. We will collect the questions and address as many as we can during the Q&A session. And with that, I'd now like to introduce Leah Kent, our technical training and, and scientific support manager here at BIUSA. Leah began her career with the human pluripotent stem cells in 2003 at Weissel Research Institute and in the lab of Dr. James Thompson at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For the past 13 years, she has been providing technical support and hands-on training for scientists across the world on a variety of methods, including stem cell culture techniques, cutting-edge reprogramming technologies, and best practices in cell culture laboratory maintenance and sterility. Thanks, Lori. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the presentation, A Practical Guide to Preventing, Detecting, and Eliminating Mycoplasma Contamination. If you work with cell cultures, chances are the word mycoplasma sends shivers down your spine. If not, I'm glad you're here to learn more. Mycoplasma contamination is a long-standing and persistent problem in cell culture labs, but many researchers don't do enough about it and many labs don't do enough to prevent it. Today I'm going to provide you with more information about mycoplasma as a contaminant and arm you with some tools to protect your lab. If you walk away with anything from this presentation, I hope you learn that mycoplasma contamination poses a serious risk to cell culture research, but that there are simple ways to safeguard your lab against it. I'll give you my top 10 tips for preventing contamination and tips for what to do if you detect mycoplasma in the lab. In this presentation, we'll cover what mycoplasma is, how it can impact your research, the common sources of contamination, and ways to prevent, detect, and eliminate it from your cultures. As a quick introduction, my name is Leah Kent, and I manage the tech support and training efforts at BIUSA. I thank a lot of my own experience to my time at YSL Research Institute in the Thompson Lab at UW-Madison, where I gained my expertise in human pluripotent stem cell culture. Since then, I've been helping establish new labs, training new researchers in cell culture, reprogramming, and other lab techniques for over 10 years. I'm happy you've joined us today to learn more about mycoplasma. I also want to let you know that there'll be a few handouts available for everyone that's attending this presentation. They're available to download from the control panel at the right side of your screen. And as Lori mentioned, there'll also be a short question and answer session. If you have a question at any point during the presentation, please just type it into the chat box. Lori's going to select a few for me to answer at the end, and if we don't read your question, I'll reply to you directly and answer you over email. So with that, let's get started. What is mycoplasma anyway? The name mycoplasma refers to the genus of these gram-negative, self-replicating species of bacteria. They're the smallest living prokaryotes, with an average size of only 0.15 to 0.3 microns. Mycoplasmas are much too small to be seen under a standard microscope, so the images in this presentation of mycoplasma cells are all taken using scanning electron microscopes. This image, for example, shows a culture of mycoplasma pneumoniae, and the magnification here is 20,000 X. Mycoplasmas were originally associated with a contagious pleura pneumonia in cattle in the late 1800s and were called pleuronemonia-like organisms, or PPLOs. Mycoplasma contamination was first detected in labs in 1956, and it's been found in all types of labs and all types of cell cultures since then. Today, we've identified more than 180 distinct mycoplasma species, and more than 20 different species have been found as contaminants in cell cultures. Mycoplasma is a widespread problem in laboratories as it can affect all types of eukaryotic cells, including rodents, insects, mammalian, and plant cells. Mycoplasmas are pleomorphic, meaning across the species, 
They don't have any true characteristic or shape, no characteristic size or arrangement. Instead, they can change their shape depending on their environment. Their membranes are also very pliable, which not only allows them to change shape, but it makes them very resistant to physical factors such as pressure, temperature, osmolarity, and dehydration. Here we're looking at images of individual mycoplasma cells. At the top of each cell are their polar tips, which are the structures that some of the species use to attach to their hosts. Across all these pictures, you can see how variable the cells are in size and shape. Particularly, you can see how their size and shape allow them to easily pass through common lab filter pores. Mycoplasma are parasites. Not only are they the smallest, but they're also some of the simplest organisms. They have an extremely small genome, and because of this, they have very limited metabolic capabilities. They must live as parasites of more complex organisms to survive. And unfortunately, all too often, our experimental cell cultures become the hosts in this situation. Our tissue culture labs provide an artificial culture system with an unlimited supply of nutrients and no immune system. Here, mycoplasma thrive, but at the cost of our cells. Unlike bacteria, yeast, and fungus, mycoplasma contamination is not obvious. There's no visible sign that the cultures have been infected. It doesn't amass any cellular buildup or cause a sharp change in pH, and it doesn't make the media appear cloudy or turbid. Mycoplasma don't overtake the cells in culture. Being well-suited and obligate parasites, they don't kill their hosts, but can live alongside them in culture for many years, using the metabolic efforts of your experimental cells to satisfy their own requirements. They live in the media, attached to cell membranes, and even inside the host cells. These images were taken using a confocal microscope and shows the binding and internalization of mycoplasma in a melanoma, melanoma cell culture. The first image, A, is a control showing uninfected melanoma cells. Image B highlights the mycoplasma seen with green fluorescence attached to the melanoma cell surfaces. And image C shows the mycoplasma in green internalized by the melanoma cells and living in the cytoplasm. So what does this all mean? How does mycoplasma impact our research? Because the presence of mycoplasma often goes unnoticed and the cells that are infecting continue to grow in culture, some of the research going on today is unknowingly being performed with contaminated cells. According to the last major FDA survey, mycoplasma contaminated roughly 15% of the 20,000 cultures tested. It's now estimated that 35% of all continuously cultured cell lines are contaminated worldwide. Since we can't see the contamination, it's very easy to spread it without knowing. And it takes just one replicating mycoplasma cell to start an outbreak. Once contamination occurs, the titer increases over time, sometimes as high as 10 billion, 10 billion colony forming units per milliliter of culture media. One single infected cell can carry about 1,000 mycoplasma cells. And often, the number of mycoplasma is 1,000-fold higher than the number of host cells in the culture. Despite such a heavy microbial load, contaminated cultures usually appear pretty normal. Mycoplasma can coexist with eukaryotic cells for years without any apparent effects, but their subtle influence can seriously compromise your cells and your experiments. Not only does mycoplasma live in the culture media, but it's also attached to and inside the host cells. This type of infection and interference can impact almost every aspect of your cell's behavior, and mycoplasma can compromise your cell cultures and experiments. Being parasitic, mycoplasma competes for and consumes the nutrients in the media, having an overall effect of hindering your cell's growth and proliferation. Mycoplasmas produce and expose your cells to unwanted metabolites. The presence of mycoplasma can also alter the levels of protein, RNA, and DNA synthesis, in turn causing changes in gene expression, cell signaling, and morphology. Damage can occur to the host's cell membranes and organelles, and depending on the specifics of the culture and contamination, mycoplasma can cause mutations and chromosomal changes, including breakage, rearrangements, and aneuploidy. 
all of these small changes inflicted on your cells can have serious effects on their overall behavior and function. You may observe your cells growing more slowly than they used to, or possibly not having great attachment after passaging. Signals and gene expression patterns may change, and your results may be erratic, or they might seem like a pattern in your experiment. These cellular changes can lead to false interpretation of your experimental results. Mycoplasma contamination poses a great risk to research quality, causing researchers to be potentially observing or publishing erroneous results. There was an interesting article in Nature recently that, ne that uh, neatly illustrates this. The publication interviewed two genome biologists from the University of Pennsylvania who found that more than one-tenth of gene expression studies showed evidence of mycoplasma contamination. The scary thing is that many of the contaminated studies they looked into were part of data sets published in leading journals. Although the presence of mycoplasma contamination doesn't necessarily negate particular data, the underlying effects that it could have on the results is really largely unknown. To better understand the global prevalence of the problem, this team looked for stretches of mycoplasma DNA in sequence data from 9,000 samples and found that 11% of them were contaminated. In the study, one particular cell line was found to have 61 different genes with expression levels that were altered by mycoplasma. As one researcher put it, all of this data coming from contaminated cell cultures is undermining research findings and wasting a huge amount of money. If more than one-tenth of cell cultures are contaminated, the costs wasted in time and resources from repeating experiments and replacing cells could put hundreds of millions of dollars at risk. So how do all these cells become infected? What are the sources of mycoplasma contamination? It's easy to blame primary cells or newly isolated tissue as the cause for mycoplasma contamination, but in fact, primary cell cultures have a relatively low contamination rate, only about 1%, as compared to continuously cell cultured cell lines. Instead, we're introducing mycoplasma to already established cultures. Interestingly, about 95% of all mycoplasma in cell culture is made up of only six species. Most commonly in labs, the species are bovine, swine, and human in origin. Human isolates specifically make up the largest percent of contaminations in cell cultures by far. So we introduce the mycoplasma contamination to the labs. There are over 23 species of mycoplasma that can infect humans, and although most are pathogenic, causing diseases like walking pneumonia, some have actually evolved to become part of our natural internal flora. As it turns out, about 80% of lab technicians carry mycoplasma. 38% of those technicians are able to contaminate a culture by a single sneeze, and 6% are able to contaminate simply by talking. Although people are a great source of new infections, the most common means of introducing mycoplasma to your cells is through an already infected cell culture. Once contamination is established, mycoplasma easily spreads through aerosols and droplet dispersion. The likelihood of cross-contamination is compounded by technical errors, such as using the same media bottle, reusing pipettes, or poor sterile technique in general. It's not unusual for all of the mycoplasma contamination in a particular lab to be all of the same species, infected once and simply transferred from culture to culture. So how do we prevent mycoplasma contamination? In this section, I'm going to be presenting my key tips for pre preventing an outbreak in the lab. Tip number one, in the cell culture lab, always wear personal protective equipment, or PPE. PPE should include, at minimum, a lab coat and gloves. Lab coats should be cleaned regularly, available for each technician, and ideally should not be shared. Wear lab coats that are dedicated specifically to the cell culture room. And wear gloves whenever handling cells, reagents, or equipment in the cell culture lab. Change your gloves often, and don't forget to sterilize them with 70% ethanol as you work. If you're sick, wear a mask. And even if you're not sick, but working with cells outside of the hood, wear a mask is a very good idea. Tip two, know your cell's origins. Infected cell cultures are by far the biggest source of mycoplasma cross-contamination. Do you know the original source of all the cells in your lab? Did they come from a cell bank, a collaborator, or the lab next door? 
always get your cells from a reliable source. Respectable companies and cell banks screen for mycoplasma as part of, part of their standard QC. Even cells frozen in liquid nitrogen can infect the lab, since mycoplasma can survive and spread in liquid nitrogen even without cryopreservation. Quarantine all new cells entering the lab and screen them for mycoplasma prior to introducing them to the rest of the lab. To maintain quarantine, use a separate incubator dedicated to housing new, suspicious, or any untested cells until they're ready. Work with these cells by themselves at the end of the day and decontaminate and sterilize your hood and equipment thoroughly every time. Tip three, use proper sterile technique. Watch for drips and pipettes as you work and clean up spills immediately. Change your pipettes and change your tips as needed. Don't double dip. A few seconds you save by, by reusing a pipette could easily cost you weeks worth of work and thousands of dollars in lost cell cultures. As a rule of thumb, avoid talking or singing around your cells. When you're in the hood or at the microscope, be mindful about the increased potential for contamination and hold conversations outside the lab. Tip four, keep your lab clean. Shared lab spaces are a danger zone for mycoplasma cross-contamination. For all cell culture labs, it's extremely important to keep the work areas clean and clear of clutter. Service your equipment regularly, making sure to change filters in the hoods, incubators, and pipetters according to their lifespan. Sterilize your work surfaces and any equipment before, during, and after you use it. In general, a 70% ethanol solution is more efficient at destroying germs than a pure solution, but you can also use a preventative solution like pharmacidal spray, which provides extra, prote extra protection against a variety of contaminants. Regularly clean your incubators. Freeze or toss any cell cultures not in use and never let those cultural dishes pile up at the back of the shelves. Wipe up all spills and drips immediately and whenever you see exposed space on the trays, take the opportunity to wipe it down. You can use pharmacidal spray here as well. It's safe for use in the incubator, even around sensitive cell cultures. The water pan inside a CO2 incubator is often overlooked, but it has great potential to spread mycoplasma. In many incubators, the internal, the internal humidity of the chamber is maintained exclusively by this water pan. Keep it clean by replacing the water regularly and add preventative solution to the water pan, such as AquaGuard 1. Of all the equipment in the lab, the water bath is probably the most prone to contamination of all kinds. It's essentially a lab jacuzzi kept at body temperature, picking up dust and waiting for something to start growing. And generally, it's the last place you put your reagents before taking them into the hood with your cells. Keep these clean with routine water changes and supplement it regularly with AquaGuard 2 preventative solution. AquaGuard 1 and 2 solutions help maintain the water quality and sterility of your incubator and benchtop water baths. These solutions are extremely easy to use and very effective against many common lab contaminants. Tip 5. Work with only one cell line at a time. And within that, have only one bottle of medium in the hood at a time. It's not a good idea to work with more than three or four dishes of cells in the hood at once. The cells don't want to be out in the cold, and the more you have going on, the easier it is to make a mistake. Tip six, don't use the hood for storage. Extra containers or equipment can block the sterile airflow circulating within the hood. A biosafety cabinet is designed to have a specific airflow pattern and flow rate. If this airflow is disrupted by a mountain of tip boxes, waste containers, pipette wrappers, or anything else, it compromises the sterility of the entire environment. Tip seven, keep the lids covered on your media and your cell culture dishes. Arrange the bottles in your hood so you're not reaching over any open dishes to get to them. Also, get in the habit of lifting your lids of your bottles and culture dishes only for those few seconds you're actively working with them. Tip eight, use antibiotics responsibly and sparingly. There are times when antibiotics are important or essential in the cell culture lab. However, they're increasingly overused. Typical antibiotics in the lab, like penicillin and streptomycin, have no impact on mycoplasmas, since they lack the cell wall that these antibiotics attack. In fact, 
Routine use of antibiotics has much, done much more harm than good for preventing mycoplasma contamination, since mycoplasma infections often co-occur with bacterial contamination. In one study, it was shown that cell lines routinely cultured in antibiotic-containing media had a tenfold higher mycoplasma rate than cultures grown without antibiotics. The long-term use of antibiotics can also hide an underlying low level of contamination, making it harder to troubleshoot your aseptic technique or materials. Tip nine, keep good records. First of all, it's important to record contamination events. Nobody likes to admit it, but there shouldn't be a stigma about contaminating. It happens. Recognizing it instead of ignoring it will help everybody in the lab improve their technique. Keeping lab-wide records is also a good way of tracking recurring issues and the key to discovering the source of a problem. Keep records of new cells entering or leaving the lab, test results, and any changes in media or reagent batches. Having this information handy makes it much easier to identify possible contamination sources if needed. Tip 10, screen for mycoplasma regularly. Because mycoplasma is difficult to detect and doesn't overtake the host cells, you could be culturing infected cells for years without knowing. And how would you know if you don't check? As mentioned earlier, always screen new cells entering the lab. Since mycoplasma can survive liquid nitrogen, screen the cells before and after thawing. If you notice any specific, 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 suspicious results or cell behavior, it's a good idea to test and rule out mycoplasma. Test your cells before starting any important or long-term experiments, as well as prior to any publication. Screen for mycoplasma should be done regularly, so you don't have to wait for a specific reason or suspicious culture. This should be done on a monthly schedule and capture samples from every dish and culture. So how do we screen and detect for mycoplasma contamination? Mycoplasma can be detected through specialized and specific tests. These tests all fall into two basic categories, direct and indirect methods. Of the different ways to screen for contamination, each has its own set of parameters, conveniences, and accuracy. The gold standard screening method is a direct assay involving the culture of contaminated mycoplasma colonies on rich agar plates. Essentially, an aliquot of the culture medium in question is inoculated into complex medium and then transferred to agar plate in a very controlled environment, and mycoplasma colonies will arise over time as present. With this method, mycoplasma colonies look like tiny fried eggs under the microscope. This direct assay is part of the required validation by regulatory and medical authorities to prove that cells and materials are free of mycoplasma. Although it's a sensitive test, it does have some limiting features. It sometimes does not detect the presence of certain elusive mycoplasma species. This assay is generally outsourced to a specialized lab and takes about three to five weeks to get results, which need to be interpreted by a trained eye. So this screening method is not done routinely in all labs, but it's important to validate cells with a direct assay like this or any cell line or any product that's being commercially sold or has intended clinical use. There are other indirect methods that are much more convenient for labs to test in-house. DNA binding fluorescent stains, such as DAPI or hook stain, can be used to test for mycoplasma. In this stain, an indicator cell line is inoculated with supernatant from experimental cell cultures. The indicator cells are, are cultured for several days and then stained with fluorescent dye. This is usually very reliable, although relatively labor-intensive and slow compared to some of the other assays available. Fluorescence in situ hybridization, or FISH, is a technique that builds on this fluorescent staining, but the incorporation of mycoplasma-specific mycoplasma probes enhances the sensitivity of the stain and can overcome the need for an indicator cell line. Immunostaining with monoclonal antibodies and the detection of ATP produced by mycoplasma-specific enzymes are other indirect staining methods that generate results quickly and can be employed in-house. These methods require some specific equipment and material and often a little interpretation of the results. Mycoplasma screening by PCR is one of the most sensitive and analytical methods available. PCR is a simple, quick way to test your cell cultures on a routine basis 
using equipment that most labs already have. The method takes advantage of conserved sequences in certain regions of the mycoplasma's small genome. The primers in the EZ PCR mycoplasma detection kit are very specific and will not detect other bacteria or animal DNA sequences, which greatly reduces false positives and other noise in the readout. PCR can be used to detect for many mycoplasma species, including the species that are difficult to detect using other methods. The EZ PCR kit comes with a complete and optimized PCR reaction mix, already containing tax polymerase, nucleotides, primers, and magnesium. The protocol is very easy, taking only a few minutes to prepare samples from a small amount of spent culture media. The primers in the EZ PCR kit are designed to amplify a specific 270 base pair fragment, so the readout's very clear, with no need for interpretation of the results. This is a simple 2% agarose gel loaded with a standard ladder, four test samples, and a positive control. To avoid false positives, always work with the positive control last to avoid accidental crossover into the sample tube or wells. Now the big question is, what do you do if you get a positive result? How do we eliminate mycoplasma from the lab? If you're worried about a false positive, you can repeat the in-house test, incorporating a secondary detection method for more accurate results. Or you can send the sample to a specialized testing service to be screened more thoroughly. The ideal solution when finding a positive result is to discard all contaminated cultures. Bleach the cells and any associated media and reagents. Disinfect and sterilize the hoods and incubators, making sure to change the filters. From there, screen all the other cells that remain in culture at an increased interval. If there's something you just can't toss without major justification, there are a few specific antibiotics, antibiotics that can overcome mycoplasma infection and help clean up the cultures. Cell lines have been successfully treated with specific antibiotics and rescued, with the general successful cell recovery of between 65 and 85 percent. Results will vary depending on the antibiotic used and the cells themselves. In the top row of images, ovarian cancer cells are contaminated with mycoplasma. They appear grainy, and you can see the mycoplasma stained with DAPI in blue in both the cell's cytoplasm and in the media. After treatment with antibiotics, the cells in the bottom row have a more normal morphology and no evidence of mycoplasma is seen with DAPI staining. If you plan to rescue cells with mycoplasma antibiotics, be sure that the treatment is thorough or the mycoplasma concentrations can be reduced but not completely eliminated. Rescreen the cells for contamination about two weeks after treatment at the earliest. There are three classes of antibiotics that have been shown to be effective against mycoplasma, fluoroquinolones, macrolides, and tetracyclines. The antibiotics in these classes are effective against many species of mycoplasma, and specific species, so multiple rounds of treatment might be necessary with more than one antibiotic. Choose your antibiotics for mycoplasma elimination carefully, as some can be extremely harsh on the cells, and others can have a high, a high tendency of developing resistant strains. The three biomic antibodies, for example, are very effective. Biomic 1 and 2 are used together in sequence for a total of seven days treatment. It might be necessary to repeat the cycle of treatment to completely eliminate contamination. Biomic 3 is also very effective against multiple species of mycoplasma. It's based on the antibiotic ciproflaxin and must be used in treatment alone. Cells are treated for two weeks with this antibiotic and it can also be repeated if the cells still test possible for contamination after one round. In summary, mycoplasma is a serious yet often overlooked issue for cell culture research. Labs need awareness and a plan. Mycoplasma routinely escapes most cell culture screens for contamination and is often passed from culture to culture and lab to lab, unknowingly putting millions of dollars of research money at risk since experimental data collected from mycoplasma-infected cell culture can be inconsistent and inaccurate. We all need to be more vigilant against mycoplasma contamination. When culturing cells in a shared space, it's particularly important to establish standardized good cell culture practices and quality control measures lab-wide. Incorporating these tips 
in a routine screening process in your lab is well worth the effort and much easier in the long run than replacing cells or repeating experiments. Thank you very much for attending the presentation, and I hope you find this information, information useful in your own labs. If you need more information, please don't hesitate to contact me directly or through BIUSA's tech support email. I can go ahead and take a few questions next, and I'll answer any questions I didn't get to directly over email. Thank you, Leah. We're now going to begin the Q&A segment of the webinar. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane. Let's get started. First question, do I need to take out all of my cells from the incubator before using pharmacidal spray? Actually, no you don't. Pharmacidal spray works best if you let the solution evaporate on its own. And we actually had a third party lab test this for us recently. Um, they sprayed the inside the incubator of very sensitive human embryonic stem cell cultures, even right on top of the plates. They spray the cultures like this uh, every few days on the days the cells were being passaged. And after five passages, they were analyzed, uh, the cells were analyzed for morphology, proliferation rates, uh, pluripotency gene expression, and even karyotype. And uh, they found that pharmacidal spray, when used as they did, had no effect on the cells and culture. And that report's posted on our website if you would like any more information about it. Okay, um, another question. Can I just bleach my work area to kill mycoplasma? Well, you definitely want to disinfect, and contam uh, dis disinfect any contaminated cell cultures with bleach. I would suggest just using enough bleach to put about 10, to make about a 10% solution and then let that sit for 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, when you're pouring it down the drain, also run a lot of cold water. Bleach doesn't make a lot of sense as a preventative, though. It's very corrosive on a lot of lab equipment, including the water bath and the incubator. It's also really toxic to the cells, and as you know, it's odorous, so you don't want to use it around the cells you want to keep in culture. Okay, uh, one more question. Is UV good enough to sterilize a hood? Well, technically, UV is a really great way to sterilize the surface, but in reality, UV lights and tissue culture hoods don't tend to have do the best job, and I would definitely not recommend using it as your only means of disinfection. So the, the UV light bulbs steadily use their, lose their effectiveness over time, and the distance from the UV light source has a big effect on the potency. And uh, remember that the UV light doesn't reach all the surfaces that are covered up, so it's one more reason to keep those tip boxes and other stuff from piling up in the hood. Okay, we have another question. Can I test cells immediately after they have been removed from liquid nitrogen? I would recommend to let them grow at least a little bit first. Um, give them enough for a passage or so. At least get them growing, um, let everything kind of recover before you test them. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for our webinar today. Please look for our follow-up email with a link to view the recording of today's webinar once available on our website. Again, thank you very much for joining us today.